ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय Today we're reading from Shrimad Bhagavatam, 10th Canto, 58th chapter, <coughs> text 8. <coughs> There's no purport, but we'll do text 8. We'll read it together, and then uh, there's a purport in text 10. Uh, Radhanath Maharaj has asked me to give class this morning. Uh, Although I do believe that Maharaj will say something also after I speak. So, uh, I'm here on his order, although he tried to do it in such a way that it wasn't an order to give me a choice, but I had no choice. <laughs> so, uh, Having difficulty seeing here. Tam, Tam. Aha, Aha Prema, Prema. Vaiklavya, <coughs> Rudha, Rudha. Kantashru, Lochana, Lochana, Smaranti. Tan Bahun Kleshan Klesha Payatma Darshanam Tama Tam A excuse me Tam Aha Prema Vaiklavya Ruda Kanta Shulochana Smaranti Tan Bahun Kleshan Lesha Payatma Darshanam Tam Aha Prima Vaiklavya Ruda Kanta Shrulochana Smaranti Tan Bahun Kleshan Lesha Payatma Darshanam Tam Aha Prima Vaiklavya Rudha Kanta Shulochana Smaranti Tan Bahun Kleshan Klesha Payatma Darshanam Ladies?
Tam to him. Aha, uh -huh. she said. Prema of love. Vaiklavya due to the distress. Rudha choking. Kanta whose throat. Ashru filled with te with tears. Lochana, whose eyes, Smaranti, remembering, Tan, those, Bahun, many, Kleshan, pains, Klesha, of pain, Apaya, for the dispelling, Atma, himself, darshanam, who shows. Translation. So overcome by love that her throat choked up and her eyes filled with tears, Queen Kunti remembered the many troubles she and her sons had endured. Thus she addressed Lord Krishna, who appears before his devotees, <coughs> to drive away their distress. Again, so overcome by love, you can repeat, so overcome by love that her throat choked up and her eyes filled with tears. Queen Kunti remembered the many troubles she and her sons had endured. Thus she addressed Lord Krishna who appears before his devotees to drive away their distress. No purport. Text 9. Tadaiva kushalam no boot, sanatas te krita vayam, gyatinas marata krishna, rata me prishitas toya. Queen Kunti said, <coughs> My dear Krishna, our welfare was assured only when you remembered us, your relatives, and gave us your protection by sending my brother to visit us. <coughs> Text 10. Natesti svapara brantir vishvasya suhridatmana tetapi smaratam shashvat kleshan hamsi hridistita Translation, for you, the wealth-wishing friend and supreme soul of the universe, there is never any illusion of us and them. Yet, even so, residing within the hearts of all, you eradicate the sufferings of those who remember you constantly. Purport. The intelligent Queen Kunti here points out that even though Lord Krishna is dealing with her affectionately as a relative, he is not compromising his, permission, his position as the well-wishing soul of the universe. In other words, the Lord doesn't play favorites. As he says in the Bhagavad Gita 9.29, Samo hamsava bhute shu, I am equal to everyone. So while the Lord reciprocates with all souls, it is natural that those who love him intensely receive his special attention, for they want him, they want him and nothing else. Om mm. Ajnana Timarandasya Giranjana Slakaya Chaksho Umiditam Jena Taz Mai Shi Rave Nama Bukam Koroti Vachalam Pangum Langaya Te Garim Yat Kripa Tamaham Bande Shi Gurun Dinataranam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shemati Bhakti Vidanta Swaman Iti Namane Namaste Sarasati Deve Gauravani Picharane Yavashe Shashanyavari Pastachati Satarane Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadardhar Shri Vasudhi Gaur Bhaktivinda 
हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे पंचकल्प चुर्भ्यश्च कृपा सिंधु पठितान पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम So here in these few verses I'm sorry we are getting the opportunity to uh see uh, some very wonderful expression or hear a very wonderful expression of deep attachment which is there within the heart of Queen Kunti and uh as we know from her prayers that she has given which were previously explained in the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam she is uh, remembering many troubles that she and her sons had endured at this particular point when Krishna is appearing before her and uh, in her prayer she described she prayed to Krishna my dear Krishna uh, your lordship protected us from so many dangerous encounters such as a great fire um such as uh, from cannibals from uh, difficulties sufferings they had to endure in the forest while they during their exile the, the great fire when pandavas were apparently burnt in the house of lack from the battle big battle with great generals had had fought and now she's praying to krishna that uh, you are protecting us from these weapons of ashvatthama so she described many different circumstances where she and her sons felt the lord's constant protection uh, under uh, severe difficulties and of course in the next verse which is a well known verse as she says vipatu tak shantu takshashvat tatra tatra jagat guru she says let those calamities happen again and again so that we can see you again for seeing you means we no longer have to receive no longer have to see repeated births and deaths in this world these uh, of course is a very well known and and uh, wonderful prayer that we sometimes quote sometimes reflect on and sometimes become bewildered <laughs> as to how such a prayer can be made uh when uh um comparing it to our own life uh how we are we prepared to ask for such calamities as severe as those which were endured by kunti and the pandavas and then uh are actually are we prepared to uh take shelter under every circumstance as they always did being confident that the lord's constant protection and of course the protection is described here is that uh we remembered you uh we remembered you and we remembered and understood that you are thinking of us uh just that thought in itself of course for queen kunti was great solace to know that the lord was thinking thinking of her thinking of her sons <clears throat> and therefore in the next verse she says uh, our welfare was assured only when you remembered us your relatives and gave us your protection by sending my brother to visit us my brother is probably a kur right yes i think she's referring to a kur there <clears throat> and um here in this verse uh she's saying that uh mm, you were the well-wishing friend and supreme soul of the universe and there's never any illusion of us and them in other words 
she's explaining that it appears that you're showing some partiality uh, because you're the well-wishing friend of everyone, but even though you're residing in everyone's hearts and the well-wisher of all living beings, it's, you're, uh, you're sim giving special attention, it seems, to those who always remember you. And she's feeling that. And, uh, of course, uh, in the commentary, uh, the well-known verse in Bhagavad Gita is quoted where Krishna says, Samoham Samabhutishu Nami Tveshu Stina Priyaha, where he says that I am not envious of anyone, I'm equal to all, uh, and whoever, but whoever renders, renders service to me is a friend to me, and I'm a friend to them. So the position of the Supreme Lord, of course, is that situated within the heart of all living beings, he's equal to everyone, and he reciprocates according to the mood of, of worship. In this connection, uh, and to this verse, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur gives the analogy of like a wish-fulfilling desire tree. And he explains that that the wish-fulfilling desire tree will uh, uh, give fruit, a particular type of fruit, uh, according to the mood of those who take shelter of it. And those who don't take shelter of it, they don't get any result. So according to the mood, whatever the mood one may want from the wish-fulfilling desire tree, then that wish fulfilling desire reciprocates according to the mood of the worshiper. You want this, you want that. It's equally disposed, fulfilling the desires of everyone who takes shelter of that tree. And for those who don't take shelter, they don't get a result. And he gives the example of that in the same way, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Supreme Lord, um, he differentiates between those who take shelter of him and those who don't take shelter of him. Uh, uh, but, and he gives a, a different result accordingly. Those who take shelter, just like the desire tree. But Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur explains that the, the speciality of the, of, the, of the Lord in comparison to the wish-fulfilling desire tree is that the desire tree will not become subordinate to those who worship. Whereas the Supreme Lord, that's his speciality, will become subordinate to those, to his bhaktis, to those who have bhakti. <clears throat> Therefore, the qualities that we may see in the Supreme Lord, that he may sometimes display, such as friendship, such as hatred, or such as indifference, are simply due to the relationship with bhakti. Because it's bhakti that controls the Lord. Nasari yatu mam yoga, nasankya dhamma uddhava, as Krishna tells Uddhava, that, that the unalloyed devotional service that's rendered to me by my devotee brings me under the control of the devotee. That's the specialty. That's the difference between the desire tree. The desire tree will give, according to the worship, will give certain results according to the mood of the worshiper. Those who don't take shelter, they get a different result. And the Lord does the same thing. And he's impartial. He's impartial. He maintains his impartiality. But uh, because the devotee, as here explained, that... The Lord, so while the Lord reciprocates with all souls, it is natural that those who love him intensely receive his special attention, for they want him and nothing else. That's the unique quality or characteristic of, of the bhakta, is when, when the bhakta, his heart is filled with bhakti, then the Lord, of course, feels bound to reciprocate. That is the well-known quality which is described as bhaktavatsarya. Right? Whereas Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur explains this quality of bhaktavatsarya, 
one should never think that uh, it's a bad quality, but it, it, it appears like he's playing favorites, but actually it's an ornament. Bushanam, it's an ornament of the Lord. It's the quality of the Supreme Lord actually which reconciles any other apparent contradiction that, that one may perceive in the behavior of the Lord. All, all other contradictions can be reconciled by this one quality, Bhaktavatsaya. That Krishna will always be consistent and that the love which is devotee and full dependence and exclusive dependence, exclusive, exclusive dependence, is manifest between the Lord and his devotee because of that exclusive dependence. And it's natural. It's natural. How can the Lord not reciprocate? He's reciprocating. He's equal to everyone. And if you want ex if exclusively depend on him, then how can the Lord at any time possibly think that this person, this devotee, who exclusively depending on me, not depending, how can I neglect? How can I not? How can I not reciprocate? How can I not, you know, even, how can I not give them my attention? How can I not remember them? They're always remembering me. How can I not remember them? It's natural. It's reciprocal. And of course, the Lord, when he thinks this way about his devotee, by always remembering them, uh, he displays this quality, this characteristic, which is so much relished and appreciated by his devotees, of how the Lord is so merciful, so kind, that he can never forget anyone who renders service to him. Never forget. <clears throat> Even the small amount of service. And he tells this to to Durvasa Muni, to whom actually the Lord appeared to be very indifferent. Right? It appeared the Lord was very indifferent to Durvasa Muni. And how can you say, he's equal to everyone, but how is it that he's indifferent to Durvasa Muni? Because Bhakti was there. Not with Durvasa Muni, Bhakti was there in Ambarish Maharaj. Because of Maharaj Ambarish's Bhakti, the Lord appeared to manifest indifference when Durvasa Muni came to him and said, you know, the well-known verse uh, where the Lord tells Durvasa Muni, he says, I'm completely under the control of my devotee. I'm, not ever, I'm never at any moment independent from my devotee. What to speak of my devotee, even those who are devotees of my devotees are very, very dear to me. And of course, what is Durvasa Muni asking? You know, the Lord... He's asking the Lord, you know, to look. I, I've gone to Brahma. I've gone to Shiva. They've been ch and I've been chased by this Sudarshan Chakra. They were incapable. They could not give me any any shelter. And they told me that it was beyond their ability to do anything. But I know it's not beyond your ability to do something. <laughs> You're the person who invoked this chakra. So now I've come before you, and and uh, I'm taking shelter of you. So what is, I'm taking shelter of you. Please protect me. And of course, the well-known conversation that is, you know, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur explains that that took place between Durvasa Muni at this time is, is that, that Durvasa Muni was saying, you know, I've come to you for shelter and please think about my situation and, you know, and manifest your heart for somebody who's coming to you for shelter and, and the Lord's indifferent. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I can't do anything to help you. What do you mean you can't do anything to help me? And uh, the Lord ex describes the bhakti that is there in the heart of Maharaj Ambarish that was controlling him. He says, actually, that my devotee, just like the verse that says, that the devotee is always in my heart, and I'm always in the heart of my devotee. The devotee doesn't think of anyone but me, and I don't think of anyone but him. 
So the Lord explains to Devasamuni, he says, the devotee, Maharajambari, she takes me into the core of his heart and he serves me so very nicely. And because he serves me so nicely within the core of his heart, naturally I want to reciprocate. So therefore I ask my devotee, please, let me give you something. Right? That's a natural reciprocation that takes place. The Lord wants to give something in return to the devotee who exclusively serves the Lord within his heart, exclusively depends upon the Lord. So when he tries to offer something to the devotee, the devotee says, hm, I'm not interested in that. <laughs> no, I don't want wealth. I don't want fame. I don't want power. And the Lord says, what can I offer you? I don't want anything. I just, just let me remember you. So many prayers we see in the Bhagavatam of the devotees, when direct darshan of the Supreme Lord, and the devotees, in the direct darshan of the Supreme Lord, the Lord's asking, what can I give you? And the, and the devotees are saying, please let me remember you. Please let me be counted as one of your devotees. Please, wherever I may go, whatever birth I may take, please recognize me as your devotee, as Lord Brahma said to to the Supreme Lord. Or the devotees may say that wherever I may take my birth, please let me, let me take birth in the association of your devotees so that I can always remember you by hearing your glories in their association. The devotee doesn't, he doesn't, never thinks to ask anything except for the opportunity to remember him and serve him by constant remembrance of him. So because the devotee is not interested just like that well-known, I often use that example, of Prahlad Maharaj, when Lord Dishringadev was asking Prahlad, please let me give you a benediction. Prahlad Maharaj said to, said to the Lord, he said, I'm not a merchant. <laughs> and don't forget, I was born in a family of, de of demons. Don't test me like this. <laughs> Why are you asking to give me something? You know, I have some bad association in this life. And here you are, you're, you're testing me by offering me something, but... I don't want to be a merchant. I'm not, I'm not engaged in your service for something in return. Be, just you be my master and let me be your servant, birth after birth. I'm happy. That is, that is a devotee. A devotee simply wants the opportunity to remember the Lord and to serve the Lord. So the Lord is telling Dravasa Muni, when Dravasa Muni is saying, you know, please, I'm taking shelter of you. You should reciprocate. Give me protection. Think of me and, and protect me. Have some heart for me. And the Lord says, no, sorry. What do you mean? And then he explains, but I've, my devotee was so dear to me, I've asked him again and again to please let me give you something. And he wouldn't let me give him anything because nothing was meaningful for him because of his deep love for me. So I had to give him something that you want from me, but I don't have right now. You're asking me to have a heart? Sorry. Not there. You're asking me to think of you? Sorry. I don't even have my mind. Because my thoughts are always with my devotee. He's always thinking of me, so I'm always thinking of him. And therefore, he, the Lord explains, because my devotee doesn't want anything, I still want to give him something, so therefore I give him the most valuable treasure in my treasure house. What can I give him that he'll consider to be of any value? I gave him my heart. And because now you're looking for me to have a heart, I'm telling you, <laughs> it's not here, it's over there. <laughs> so the Lord explains explaining this to Durvasa Muni, and by this example, by this perfect example, it's showing how bhakti controls the Lord, and the Lord's indifference, apparent indifference, is towards Durvasa has nothing to do with Durvasa Muni, but it has to do with Maharajan Barisha's bhakti. And therefore, wherever the Lord displays either friendship, or hatred, just like what the Lord told Diodana, 
He said, because you're envious of the Pandavas, Pandavas and because uh, you're their enemy, therefore you're my enemy. <laughs> it has nothing to do with, you know, Diodana was inviting the Lord, you know, to his home and, you know, asking him, please come. And, but the Lord was not willing to accept the invitations. He said, no, because you're an enemy of the Pandavas, because of their full dependence on me. His apparent enmity had nothing to do directly with, with Diodhana, but it had to do with the Pandavas. Their bhakti. He's controlled by that bhakti. Although he's equal to everyone, the speciality of the Lord's characteristic that's different than the desire tree is that the Lord becomes subordinate to his devotee. And because he becomes subordinate to his devotee, therefore, whatever may appear to be like friendship, of course, when Krishna says, whoever renders service to me is a friend to me and I am a friend to them, that's Krishna's friendship is not, as explained right here, he, he is not compromising his position as the well-wishing soul of the universe. In other words, the Lord doesn't play favorites. Why? The Lord is not busy or absorbed in the mentality, or as the verse itself says. He says, for you, the well-wishing friend and supreme soul of the universe, there's never any illusion of us and them. Right? Like us and them, that, that mentality comes in the mind of a person who thinks that, yeah, because you're my friend, I'm your friend. All right? And uh, if you have any, if you're not my friend, enmity towards me, then I'm not your friend. So I'm friends with those, us, we're together, and you're an enemy of me, you're in the enemy. But the Lord doesn't think us and them in relationship to himself. All right? He's equal to everyone. There's no question of us and them. It's not a relationship. There's no enemy for the Lord. Nobody's successful. You know, on, on being an enemy of the Lord or the Lord dealing with anyone as an enemy because whatever the Lord does is always for the ultimate benefit, even of the apparent enemy. When the Lord kills the demons, they get liberation. Whatever he does, whatever the Lord does, it's always for the benefit of the recipient. So it's no question of us and them in relationship to the Lord. It's not like he's some politician that needs to stay in his position because I'm getting votes of my friends and if you're not voting for me, <laughs> you're my enemies. And, and uh, he doesn't need, doesn't need votes to stay in his position as the Supreme Lord. He is. <laughs> and doesn't make any difference if anyone votes for him or not. He still is. <laughs> that is his position. It's the Supreme Lord. So he's not in an us and them consciousness in relationship to himself. He's equal to everyone. He reciprocates according to the way that they approach him. Like, just like the desire tree. But the speciality is, of course, that love that the devotee has. And the devotee, of course, feels so much attachment to the Lord. Medits always meditating upon the lotus feet of the Lord, always remembering the Lord. And the Lord explains, just like he explains in, in the Bhagavad Gita, in the 12th chapter, that for one who is always meditating on me, serving me, I become for them the swift deliverer of repeated birth and death. He delivers them. He becomes, he frees them from all, all the distresses of the devotee. There is a verse, third canto, Srimad Bhagavatam, Marashaya Katabhishta, Shinvanti Katiyaticha, Tapanti Vivitas Tapa Naita Gacha Tichesasa. Lord Kapila Dev says that engaged constantly in hearing and chanting about me. My sadhu, the sadhus, they don't suffer from material miseries. 
because they're always filled with thoughts of my activities and pastimes in this world. And she's telling Devahuti. Those who are always absorbed in thoughts, remembrance of the Lord. Right? Just like the devotee, under all circumstances and all difficulties and all distress, the devotee very naturally, spontaneously remembers the Lord. I was just reading a verse the other day in the Bhagavatam in Mayapur. We were giving class from one verse. But Prabhupada was, the verse was actually spoken by Lord Shiva about duality. It came right after the verse, Narayana Paraksave Nakutashchanya Bibhati Svarga Pavagra Narakesh Tulyati Darshana. There, where Lord Shiva was telling Parvati, because Parvati was bewildered. She couldn't understand how is it. I, I, I just gave a curse to Chichiketu Maharaj to take birth in a demon, as a demon. And uh, Chichiketu Maharaj understood fully what that curse meant. You know, he was going to take birth as a demon. He came down as he was in his traveling in his plane. He came down before Lord Shiva and Parvati, and he, he was like completely equipoised, fully accepting. I'll accept whatever, whatever your will is that I will accept it. And Parvati was completely bewildered. Say, how? What is this? What? How is it possible? I just cursed him to be a demon, and he's so he doesn't fear. There's no fear. He's fully accepting. He's ready just to to go on accepting that curse. And Lord Shiva explains that's. That's the nature of a bhakti, that's a devotee. Narayana Paraksave Nakutashinya Bhivati. He says that devotees don't fear any condition of life, whether in heaven, whether in hell, whether they're liberated. For them, it's all the same. Why? Because for their devotee, whether he's in heaven, hell, or liberated, he's only interested in one thing only that's service. That's all. He's only interested in service. And of course, one of the most favorable ways to render service to the Lord is to constantly remember him <laughs> under all circumstances. And then, in the next verse, Lord Shiva began describing the nature of the dualities of the, of the material world. And then in the verse that we spoke from, then Lord Shiva was explaining about how the devotee is transcendental to dualities. And that how in the material world, there's always, Prabhupada quoted in the commentary, Dvete Badra Badrigan Sabu Manadama, E Bala E Manda E Sabu Brahma, who describes in, in the material world, to say this is good, this is bad, it's all mental speculation. And he says that therefore, to say this is good, this is bad, it's all a mistake. And he's explaining that in the dualities of the material world, we tend to think this is good, this is bad, in terms this is pleasing, makes me happy, this is bad, it causes suffering. And Prabhupada explained in the commentary that in the material world, in the, in the, in the consciousness of duality, there's no such thing as good and bad. It's all a mistake. It has nothing to do with the transcendental platform. And for those who are in the transcendental consciousness, they see that even the miseries of the material world as happiness. And then Prabhupada quoted the verse, Kaivalyam Narakayate, Tridasa Purakasha Pushpayate, Durdan Dendriya Kalasapa Patali, Potkata Dangstayate, Vishvam Purna Sukayate, Vidi Mahendra Hadis Chatkitayate. Yat karunya kataksha vaibhava vatam tam gora evastuma. He quotes that verse and he specifically emphasizes that for anyone who has received the merciful glance, that glance of Lord Chaitanya, for anyone who receives that merciful glance of Lord Chaitanya, kaivalyam narakayate, then to get liberation or the concept of liberation, of kaivalya, it's like hell. And then, you know, the 
planets or the heavenly planets are like phantasmagoria. In fact, the whole verse it was about dreams and how the, in the material world there is bad dreams and good dreams and we think this is a bad dream and good dream but actually and we are happy and we're distressful in relationship to bad dreams and good dreams. And we gave that example from the 11th canto of the Bhagavatam that was given by uh, the sage Kavi, one of the nine Yogendras in his conversation with Maharaj Nimi when, when Maharaj Nimi was asking about the nature of devotional service and how to become freed from fear. And then uh, the sage Kavi explained how fear arises, arises due to the being absorbed in the in material consciousness and the bodily concept of life and thinking of one's material body and therefore by forgetting Krishna one forgets that he's an eternal servant of Krishna. And then in the next verse he says that although the duality of the material world doesn't ultimately exist, the conditioned soul considers it to be real under the influence of his conditioned intelligence. And he says this uh, imaginary experience of a world that's not connected to Krishna, that's separate from Krishna, is compared to be like dreaming and desiring. When a conditioned soul dreams at night of something very wonderful or something very horrible, or when he daydreams of something he would like to have or something he would like to avoid, he creates a reality that has no existence beyond his imagination. And he's explaining exactly the nature of the dualities of the world how even good and bad in this material world is all bad. And we become happy. And he uses this, this analogy, this is a wonderful analogy, I've given it before here, but it's such a perfect analogy about dreaming because everybody, everyone can relate to dreaming because most people, has anybody here ever dreamed before? Anybody, please raise your hand, have any of you ever had a dream before? No, nobody's had a dream before. Okay, then I can't use it now. <laughs> right? Prabhupada, Prabhupada uses an, an analogy to help us understand the importance of analogies. <laughs> he uses the analogy, he says that if you want to see the moon moving in the sky at night, if you stare at the moon, it's very difficult to see how it's moving. He says, but if you look at the moon, through the branches of a tree, because the branches are closer. You can see that from this branch to that branch, how the moon is moving by staring at the branches of the tree. So he says, similarly, we need analogies, something within our realm of experience to, to help us understand something that may be too theoretical, we can't connect to it, too far away. So the example is of dreams, because all of us have dreams. So if we have a a dream, a very good dream. All right. Anybody had good dream before? <laughs> okay. Anybody had a bad dream before? Yeah. Okay. So you you can relate to this then. When you have a good dream, and then you're enjoying. Usually good dream means it's, it's enjoyable, it's nice, you know. Yeah. And then all of a sudden something happens, you wake up, you're sad. You feel, wow, it was a dream. I thought it was so real, it was a dream. So you feel very sad. But when you have a bad dream, and, you know, tiger, beaten by a tiger, or like, like sometimes I, I, I I, I have this experience a lot because I fly a lot. When I'm in a plane, I may fall asleep and I, my, and my, I start dreaming that the plane is falling very fast. <laughs> <laughs> and I wake up and I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> it was only a dream. <laughs> but Kavi explains that the happiness and distress, the happiness we feel in relationship to the bad dream and the distress we feel in relationship to the, to the good dream, they're not connected to reality. They're only connected to a dream. There's no connection to reality at all. And he says, 
That's the night dream. Then there's the daydream. <laughs> and, and the daydream, Prabhupada explains in the commentary, is absolutely no different than the night dream. In the daydream, we dream of something we would like to have. And we dream about something we'd like to have, and then we feel happy. You know, we, yes, I feel good. Yeah, I, I'd really like to have that. And then, of course, because it's, it's not connected to reality, because we're trying to enjoy something separate from Krishna, that when we get the fulfillment of our so-called daydream, it doesn't quite, doesn't quite fit the bill. That's not exactly what we usually... What, didn't bring us all the happiness that we were expected, especially when, when we lose it. Or we see the other problems that come with it. <laughs> you know, many other problems we didn't anticipate. We just thought about the, that daydream and then so many other problems that we didn't anticipate all of a sudden appeared. So then that's the daydream and then things that we would like to have and things we would like to avoid, like everybody tries to avoid death, try to avoid disease, and try to avoid suffering. And sometimes people even think that they're happy if they're not suffering. That's, you know, they, how are you, Prabhu? And, well, now that you mention it, I'm, things aren't that bad. <laughs> I guess I must be happy. <laughs> but there's much more to, to happiness <laughs> than not suffering. But we think happiness and distress in relationship to the daydream, it's no different than the happiness and distress in relationship to the night dream. It's just no difference. So Prabhupada is explaining in the commentary of that verse that for a devotee, he says that vishram purna sukhayate. He says for a devotee, for one who gets that merciful glance of Lord Chaitanya, then the whole universe becomes ecstatic. The devotee is happy, even in distress. After class, one devotee came up to me and said, Maharaj, now wait a minute. How can we be happy in distress? <laughs> couldn't, couldn't somehow. And then I tried to explain to him about Queen Kunti. I tried to explain to him about the verse, Tatenu Kampam Susha Mikshamano Bujana Ivat Makritam Vipakam. The how a devotee, he ex tolerates all of the distresses of, of his life because it gives him the opportunity to remember the Lord. And he sees that what is, a nature, what is the spontaneous nature of a devotee? What is the test of the devotee? The test of the devotee, the, in the face of adversity, the devotee is not thinking how to counteract. And similarly, Ambarish Maharaj didn't think of how to counteract. He just very naturally remembered the Lord. It was natural for him. Prabhupada said in purport, Maharaj Ambarish did what was natural for him. He didn't say to the Lord, protect me. He just naturally remembered the Lord. And because he naturally remembered the Lord, because it was so natural for a devotee in the, in the face of adversity to remember the Lord, he felt completely protected. And because he was completely remembering the Lord and fully dependent on the Lord, the Lord said, well, I'm going to step in and protect him. Even though he's not asking for it. He's happy just to remember. So that's the difference between the devotee. The devotee finds his happiness even in the face of adversity because it's very natural to remember the Lord. And by remembering the Lord, Marashreya katamishta shrinvanti katayanti cha. Engage constantly in remembering me. Always speaking about me. Always hearing about me. So those devotees, they don't suffer from material miseries because they're always filled with remembrance of me. And of course, in the next verse, in Lord Kapila Dev says, Taete sarava sadvi sava sangha vivajita sangashte shvatate patya sangha dosha harahite. He says, oh, my mother, oh, virtuous lady, you seek out the association of these persons who are always remembering me and become attached to them and hear from them. And you become attached to hear from them, you'll remember me and it will counteract all the pernicious effects of your material attachments. Therefore, because of that nature, that, that nature of the devotee to be in the face of adversity, to remember the Lord, 
he accepts that remembrance of the Lord, that that's what makes him happy. And therefore the devotee, his greatest fear, his greatest fear in any place, wherever he may be, is to, is to forget the Lord. That is his fear. That is all. And therefore he always prays, let me remember you. Always keep me in the association of your devotees. Let me always be hearing your glories in the association of your devotees. When Haridas Thakur was asked for a benediction from the Lord, then the, and uh, Haridas Thakur said, you know, that I'm going to ask for something, but forgive me for being so arrogant for asking for something very high. <laughs> he said, please, just let me, birth after birth, have the remnants of foodstuffs from your devotees. <laughs> and that's all I ask for. Just keep me somehow in the association of your devotees. This is how a devotee finds his shelter. By always staying in the association of devotees and always getting the best opportunity. The best opportunity. Narada Muni says to King Prachina Bahishat, he says, in a place where my pure devotees congregate, always discussing the pastimes of the Lord, if one gets the chance to hear the river of nectar, which flows like the waves of the river, if one gets caught up in that flow of nectar coming from the devotees, then one will forget about all the necessities of life, such as hunger and thirst. And one will become free from all kinds of illusion, lamentation, and fear. Get caught up in that. Like, it's like getting caught in a tsunami. You're caught in a tsunami. You can't do anything. You're caught. And when you get caught up in the, in the waves, well, the devotees are always discussing the glories of the Lord. It's an opportunity to remember the Lord. And by that remembrance, then one not only feels sheltered by the remembrance of the Lord, but then one actually, as Queen Kunti is here praying, that the Lord is so kindly remembering me. He's given me the opportunity. He's remembering me because I've developed the urge to hear his messages. That's what he says. Shrinvata Svakata Krishna Punya Shavana Kirtana. Hridantyasto Yabudani Vidunoti Suhit Satam. The Lord is sitting within the heart of every living being. He remembers that devotee who develops the urge to hear his messages when they're in, which are in themselves virtuous when properly heard and chanted. And what does he do? Not only does he remember his devotee, but he acts within the heart to remove all the obstacles all the impediments within the heart of that devotee, to make that devotee's heart completely pure and clean, removes all obstacles. The devotee feels the Lord is so kind, he remembers me, just by developing the urge to hear about him constantly. He's acting within the heart. And this is what Queen Kunti is, she's praying in this way also. She says, our welfare is assured only when you remembered us, your relatives and gave us your protection. So, this, these three verses here help us to understand the unique characteristic or quality of, or the power of, of the Lord's pure devotees. And although we may think, well that's, sometimes we have a tendency to think that's the Lord's pure devotee, but What's that got to do with me? <laughs> we think, oh yeah, there's, there's always those pure devotees in the Bhagavatam, we hear about them, but, but actually, what does it have to do with us? It's very relevant. It has a lot to do with us. And although it may be not us, that anyone who develops faith in hearing about these pure devotees, then Krishna accepts the desire to hear about them as good as service to him. He accepts it to be as good as service. Simply to cultivate the desire to hear about these devotees. He says in the Bhagavatam, having awakened his faith and hearing the narrations of, of my glories, in the 11th canto of the Bhagavatam, he says, having awakened faith in the narrations of my glories, being disgusted with sense gratification, knowing that all sense gratification leads to suffering, but still not able to give it up. 
My devotee continues to worship me with faith and remains happy because my devotee knows that even though sense gratification lives, leads to suffering and he can't give it up, he, he, because he's awakened faith and hearing the pastimes of the Lord, he sincerely repents for any sense gratification he, he commits because he knows that the Lord is so kind. <laughs> the Lord is so kind because of that faith. He accepts that faith to go on hearing about him to go on hearing. Accepts that faith that despite, the, if I simply go on hearing, that Krishna will act from within the heart and he'll remove all the obstacles and, and impediments from within the heart. And he'll actually help me right? by my constant endeavors, by that constant endeavor to remember him and to hear about him. He'll remove all the obstacles from within. That is how he acts within the heart of his devotee. Within the heart of the non-devotee? Different story. He doesn't have to get so directly involved. He lets, right, he's simply there as witness and giving sanction. There's no lila. <laughs> Just witness and giving sanction. He's simply allowing them to, like a desire tree. <laughs> you don't take shelter of me? Okay. Material nature will take care of everything for you. <laughs> but my devotee who always remembers me, he always endeavors. He's out of compassion for them. I'm who dwelling within their hearts. I destroy with the shining lamp of knowledge the darkness born of ignorance. I'll help them to come to me. Special. Special attention because of taking shelter in these transcendental narrations. This is, uh, of course, the benefit of hearing about such great devotees as Queen Kunti and hearing her realizations about uh, the nature of the, the Lord's uh, reciprocal love to those who exclusively love him. I, maybe I should end here, if that's okay. <laughs> you, actually, you were going to speak. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I need to hear. <laughs> And I don't need to hear anything about me. Padaya, Krishna Pristaya Bhutale, Srimate Bhakti Vedanta, Swami Niti Namine, Namaste Saraswati Deve, Gauravani Pracharine, Nirvishesha Shunyavadi, Paschatyade Satarine, Bansha Kalpatarubyascha, Kripasindubya Ebacha, Patitanam Bhavanibhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasadigo Bhakta Brinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hari Hari <coughs> Good 
Let us express our deep gratitude to His Holiness Naranjan Swami Maharaj for this eloquent, insightful, purely devotional tsunami <laughs> of Harikata. was speaking of Queen Kunti's prayers. In the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, we find the scene after the battle of Kurukshetra, after the Pandavas were victorious. Yudhisthira Maharaj is coronated as king and everything seems very peaceful. And Queen Kunti is offering her prayers because Krishna is about to leave. And she's praying, let these calamities happen again and again. When we read these stories we should read or hear not only with our ears and our mind's attention, but with our hearts also. Sometimes we think we're in difficult situations, but really what was Kunti's calamities that she was talking about? We just heard how her own relatives, her own nephews were trying to kill her children in the house of lack, to literally burn them to death. And she was with them at the time. But somehow or other Vidura helped them and they escaped. Vidura was her brother-in-law. And then in that sense. Then we find they were exiled. She saw Draupadi being insulted. During the battlefield of Kurukshetra, her eldest son Karna, who she loved as much as her other children. She saw her eldest son and her and Arjuna, another son, worst enemies who wanted to destroy each other. And then she saw one of her children kill her other child. Arjuna killed Karna. Now those of you who are mothers, what kind of distress would that have in your heart? Abhimanu was her grandchild. She saw him slaughtered by unfair means. And she witnessed the pain of Subhadra and Arjuna, their mother and father. 
she saw five of her other grandchildren, a child from each of her sons to Draupadi. They were slaughtered while they were sleeping by Aswatthama, killed. I'm a Swami, I don't know so much about direct experience of these things, but I see grandparents usually love children as much or more than the parents themselves. She saw her son die at the hands of another son. She saw six of her grandchildren die in a most ignoble way, not chivalrously. These are serious calamities. They weren't just things that happened to her. They were things that she was seeing happen to those who she loved most. And yet, she's praying to Krishna, let those calamities happen again and again. Because in these situations, I remember you. I have nowhere else to turn except you. I have no other shelter. And in seeing you, I don't have to, in remembering you, and I see you, and in seeing you, I don't have to experience birth or death anymore. So the calamities of the death of loved ones, the calamities of being cheated, the calamities being of, of the physical pains, watching her five children and their wife living in the exile of the forest and being hunted. And it was very difficult. If she could have been there with them, it would have been much easier. But she wasn't allowed to go with them. She was at Vidura's house in Hastinapur. And she would just have to hear about these things. And she would hear the nasty, terrible rumors being spread around Hastinapur by Duryodhana about her own children. This is the exalted status of Kunti. Now, if she was just some sort of hard-hearted, detached yogini, it wouldn't have been the same type of prayer. But devotees have soft hearts. She was a mother. She was a grandmother. She was a wife and her husband died. Practically everything possible we could think that could happen to a person happened to her. And it's not that she didn't suffer, but in that suffering, she was experiencing the eternal joy of remembering Krishna. And the more desperate the suffering, the more desperately she took shelter of Krishna. And that's the meaning of this prayer. And Srila Prabhupada said, whether we pray for calamities or not, they will come. <laughs> we really, we don't have to pray like Kunti for calamities. Because they're gonna come anyway. Everyone's gonna die anyway. And the setbacks of this world and the reversals and the unfairness of, of envious people, it's always going to come upon us. The real prayer is under all circumstances to always remember you, Krishna. And her own daughter-in-law, Draupadi, what is the most famous inspiring story of Draupadi. 
How many times do we hear in lectures about how happy she was when she got to marry Arjuna? Or how happy she was when Bhima would prepare a nice feast for her? <laughs> but when she was being stripped naked by Dushasana, and there was no one who was protecting her, she felt utterly betrayed by everyone she trusted in this world. And in that state, she understood only Krishna is my real friend who can save me. And she helplessly lifted her arms and cried out, Hey Krishna, Hey Govinda. In the intensity of her surrender, Sharanagati, Krishna appeared before her. That's the glory of her life, that instant. That inspires people five millenniums later, more than any other. And Kunti was watching all these things happening. His Holiness Naranjan Maharaj was speaking about the day dreams and the night dreams. Srila Prabhupada would write to us, all of his devotees, he would say, I hope this meets you with good health. So what's this health? <laughs> of course, spiritual health, but he was also talking about emotional health and physical health too. If it's all a dream, who cares? The body's just a dream and the miseries we're going through are just a dream and, the, and who cares? Just Why even try to liberate people? <laughs> because whatever suffering you're going through is just a dream anyway. The soul is eternal. The soul is full of bliss. Because a devotee although he understands or she understands the nature of these good dreams and bad dreams, daydreams and night dreams, still, still it's the Atma that's identifying with it. And a devotee feels compassion. What does Prabhupada mean when he says paradukha dukhi? A devotee suffers when he sees others suffering and he sees and he's happy when he sees others happy well if all suffering is just a dream why should we suffer when we see somebody suffering a dream it's because the eternal soul that part of krishna that's loved so much by krishna if krishna loves us therefore a devotee loves us Identifying with this dream is what causes suffering. And devotees feel suffering when they see others suffering. But there's a difference. Because when an ordinary, materially oriented person <clears throat> suffers to see another suffer, he's t we just try to make a makeshift change the dream from a suffering dream to a more happy dream. That's all a material person can do. But a devotee wants to wake, wake us up. In Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was speaking to Haridas Thakur and he was really suffering. He said, my heart is feeling such pain to see all the people suffering in this world in forgetfulness of Krishna. And Haridas Thakur said, but you came here to wake them up from the dream of the suffering, from the bad and good sufferings. Because you have... You have come to this world and you have personally chanted the holy names. Jeev Jago, Jeev Jago, Gora Chandra Pole, Kota Nidra Jayomaya Pisa Chirakole. 
The daydream is because we're sleeping in the lap of maya, of illusion. And yes, we feel for people who are dreaming in this way. Good dream, bad dream. It's all bad. Because it's all, di it's all distracting us from our true natural wake wakeful state. Jivera swaropoi krishna rinati dats, that we're all eternal servants of Krishna. And love for Krishna is our true nature. But to actually understand this, Mahajano Yena Gatasa Panta, we must follow in the footsteps of great souls. And the great souls come to this world and pass through situations that are very similar to us, but they show us how to do it. And that is Kunti. She didn't select the sufferings. She didn't, you know, place an order on the internet to let my five grandchildren die and let Abhimanu die and let my eldest son be killed by my younger son. These were things that she was trying to, to avoid like anything because she's a mother and a grandmother. The, the mo the, whatever could pain her heart the most, it all happened. <coughs> but she never felt Krishna why she understood that Krishna is my only shelter and she understood that by give by taking shelter of Krishna Krishna would give his highest mercy to all of her loved ones and to everyone. Now in today's verses, which is from the 10th canto, Kunti's in a very different situation. Because in the first canto we read, the war's over. All the problems, they've already happened. Now you destroy Maharaja's king. And she's offering her prayers to Krishna. This is the most difficult moment of my life now. Because you're leaving us. <laughs> when the calamities are here, you're always together. You're always with us. But now that everything's all right, I may forget you. That was her prayer. But in today's verses, it's right in the middle of everything. While she's speaking to Krishna, Duryodhana is in the palace. Karna is in the palace. Shakuni, Dushasana, they're all there. What's going to happen next? They just tried to murder and burn alive the Pandavas. The Pandavas were hiding, they're coming back, and she knows the envy and the, the hatred of her of her nephews is worse than ever. But Kunti, in her gracious, divine, motherly nature, has simply given her heart to Krishna. His Holiness Naranjan Swami Maharaj has so eloquently told how Krishna gave his heart to Ambarish Maharaj. So when Durvas Muni is saying, please have a heart, protect me, I'm taking shelter of you. So beautifully he explained, I don't have my heart. Ambarish has my heart, you have to go to him. That is actually that principle of how devotee gives his or her full heart to Krishna and Krishna reciprocates by giving his full heart to his devotee. That is the 
ultimate culmination of all the knowledge of all the scriptures. That is truly the essence. Whatever rules, whatever regulations, whatever philosophical explanations may be there, this pastime of the Lord being subordinate to the devotee's love and the devotee being subordinate to the Lord's love is the essence of all truths. That's what Srila Prabhupada came to give us. And who are we to understand the essence of all truths? But if we have a simple heart with faith to receive it, and as Maharaj said, if we actually take great happiness in hearing about the great devotees of the Lord, what is their love for the Lord? And what is the Lord's love for the devotees? Just by developing that taste to appreciate another Vaishnava's love, that is actually how the doors to our hearts open to receive that love ourselves. It's most important. Duryodhana, he was living with the Pandavas. They loved Krishna, but he didn't appreciate their love. He was envious of the blessings they were receiving. Srila Prabhupada explains that if we are just not envious, if we just have a simple heart and we can appreciate the the, the devotion of others and appreciate the blessings that Krishna is giving others and appreciate how Krishna is conquered by the love of a devotee and how a devotee is conquered by the love of Krishna. And that mainly comes through hearing. then we become qualified also. Queen Kunti's prayer, Vipada Shantu Tasha Shvatatra Tatra Jagat Guru, let calamities come again and again so that I can remember you. You'll never come to be able to, to understand that prayer just through philosophy. It's too much beyond philosophy. It can only happen, we can understand that prayer when we see, receive Krishna's grace. And Krishna will give us that grace when we learn to love and appreciate those who he, have, he has given his heart to. This is really what it means to be the servant of the servant. Thank you, His Holiness Naranjan Swami Maharaj. And I want to say one thing to you. You may be a little proud by how you clapped for him. <laughs> but in Ukraine, they clap at least a million times louder. <laughs>